Okay. Well, welcome to Blue Collar Startup. Our mission is to facilitate the growth and development of blue collar businesses. Each episode, we showcase real blue collar businesses and interviews and use these stories to help educate and empower the next generation of trades workers to become blue collar business owners. This is the Blue Collar Startup. This week, we're here with Matt Smith, Ace Home Inspection. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Got I'm welcome. Blue, I got my blue collar on. So you got. You are on. in fact wearing a blue collar. Yeah, I came prepared. That's nice. That's very. Uh, I want the audience to know I'm one of them. Just, that you just that you ha- that you are yeah. it. You're yeah. living it. You're wearing it. Yeah. You Protected. you have it. Yeah. All right. So uh, so Matt, why don't we you know start the beginning right? Just tell us who you are. Oh, well, I already told them who you are. But tell us uh, about your business, what you do, and uh, and then we'll see where the hell this thing goes from there. Uh, it's not a very thrilling business, but uh, we do home inspections. So we go in most likely through a, a real estate transaction and we just make sure the house is safe and you know things are functioning. So we give life, ex- life expectancies, make sure there aren't any major defects, so make sure somebody is getting into a money pit or have any surprises when they move into a house. Uh, we do a ton of inspections. We're one of the few companies in the country that does it. So we encompass a lot more than just the home. We do septics and chimney inspections, pool inspections, sprinkler inspections, all kinds of riveting things. Um, but you know, our service is really where we stand out. That's what we do best. You know, anybody can tell you what a roof looks like, but in order to convey it properly, that's really what we focus on, and that's why we've excelled so much at it. Now you're kind of minimizing it, you know, saying it's not that riveting. I, but look, I mean it. it if you've ever been to through a home inspection or where you've had your own home inspection done, I mean, it's pretty interesting stuff. I like yeah. the systems of your house. I mean, you're going to live in this place for, I mean, what's, I don't know what the average uh, life of a home anymore is. I know that used to, back in the day when I was in real estate, it was like four and a half, five years was the average time someone spent in a home. I don't know what that is now, but uh, even still, if you spend five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years in a house, those systems are uh, pretty damn important. They are. I, well, I, okay, I shouldn't say it isn't riveting, but it's um, it's minimized even by buyers. You know, a lot of times yeah. they go into the house, do the inspection, and they're measuring for blinds and for couches. I'm like, you don't even home this place yet. Um, very few people really care to be educated on what's going on with the house. And that's really what it is. And sometimes you find problems. And that's how I explain it to people. Like, we're just going to tell you how this house functions and some things that could be a little bit better. It's people really like the garnishing of it. They like the what blinds they're going to do, what color they're going to paint a room. They, they the functionality of, of the house really goes unlooked, which is why we're always going to be in business. Um, I feel like <laughs> a lot of people too have generationally gotten out of being handy. Uh, it's yeah. it's really lost, and it's uh, you know my my parents couldn't really give me a lot of money. They couldn't give me any money. But man, the education that I got from my dad has paid dividends over and over and over and over again. It's definitely seven figures that I've saved by being able to you know, do work on my own homes and being able to do this career. Uh, if, if people just pay attention a little bit more, and they can save themselves a lot of money, a lot of grief, and understand what, what's happening. But they seem to think that you know, just because we know what we're talking about, we give it our blessing or not, it doesn't mean that something can't go wrong as soon as we close the door. So it's a really good education session on how the house functions. That way there, if you know, we expect it in the summertime, you know, in the winter, something is, you know, not right. You may know where to look and, and know what to do. I, I think everybody should do their own home inspection a couple times a year on their house just to make sure everything is, is okay. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times you go in and we go in the attic, we find issues. And someone's like, well, I've never been up there. I mean, we don't really have any <laughs> reason to, but... It would be a good idea if you just checked on yeah. things, you know, yeah. before it became a major problem. And that's the, that's really what uh, you know, we do is you know, it's, we really want to educate people, and let them know what's going on with the house. You're, you own it. You should know how this thing functions, what's going on with it. And, you know, any other big purchase, you don't really do that. I mean, you, you get your car inspected, but that's really for, you know, as a New York State mandate. You know, you, you could buy a $400,000 car. Are you having someone inspect it and go through it? You're right. Like, no, you're not. But so, you should. Well, I would if say... If I you, bought... So here, I'm, I'm in a similar uh, vein as, like, I think everybody should know how to do at least some of some general stuff around the house, right? I mean, so we own a farm. There's always shit breaking. There's always something that needs some type of work done to it, and and it's it's. I always laugh because I Kristen laughs at me because 
we'll start talking about a project and I'm like, well, I, no, I, I listen, I, like we were just talking about the driveway project earlier. I'm like, ah, oh, I, you know, listen, I can spend a few thousand dollars on stone and spread that shit myself with a tractor. It'll be fine. Da, da, da. She's like, yeah, but I want it done right. And I, shots fired. Right. But, uh, not that I wouldn't do it right, but she is, you know, she just wants it to be something bigger and better. I can do the general, like it, you know, if there's a hole, if there's this, I can fix that stuff. Sometimes I need to call and help. Roofing, plumbing is something I've always refused to learn how to do because as soon as I know how to do plumbing, then you got to deal with people's poop. Yeah. I don't want anything to do with that. Um, but, uh, but I do, I agree. I think it's important that everybody knows some things about their house, checks on their house. I think well, that's I great. Mean, the thing that we, the stuff that we fill our brains with is, I, you, know, you can tell who's doing who in Hollywood and Johnny Depp's divorce and, and I'm like, you know, nobody, <laughs> nobody knows how to change an outlet. You know? Right, and yeah. I'm not saying everybody needs to know how to do that, but man, what we're really filling our heads with, I mean, it, you can save yourself a lot of grief is what I'm, is what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, we see people get taken advantage of by contractors a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and part of the issue with the contractors is they're not necessarily wrong, right? If you call somebody to recite this building, you're calling them to do that. You know they're gonna they're gonna give you a quote to resize the whole building, whether they think you need it or not. Yeah. You seem to think so. So they really draw things out. You, know, you get a you get a better order of magnitude when you really start taking things apart and looking at them and, and doing them. So, yeah. Um, well, that's to your point too. So we had a, a roof situation with our garage, and uh, you know it's a metal it's a metal roof, but it's all panels. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, the advantage here is that as a panel deteriorates, I can just replace a panel. I don't have to do the whole roof. Well, so we had a panel that needed to be replaced. And Kristen's like, well, let's, let's just have somebody come over and look at it. Because <laughs> she thinks. Anyway, uh, let's have somebody come over and look at it. So we had, you know, but they want to replace the whole damn roof. None of them want to do the $300 replace the panel job. They all want to do the $30,000 brand new roof job. And, and again, to your point, I was like, hell no. <laughs> well, you could make an excuse to, to do anything, right? You know, it's it, it's not really right or wrong, but is it absolutely necessary? Like, does this, like, you know, is there going to be terrible ramifications if you don't do this? I mean, I'll be honest with you, more times than not, the answer is no. I mean, mm-hmm. so many things are blown out of proportion. I mean, the amount of time to find things that are just, like, wow, you really need to reconsider buying this home is very few. And we do about 2,000 inspections a year so I would say maybe one a month yeah maybe I, I you know that's a dozen a year you know a dozen to two dozen a year about 2,000 but how many do you think at least identify a significant deficiency that if they weren't identified before the sale of the house you know like again you go in there you find out that hey there's this old furnace down here you know those old octopus for, you know, just any of those issues that could be tens of thousands of dollars to repair or fix, and you're able to identify those problems ahead of time. I mean, I would think that's worth the cost of the... Uh, well, it is, but I mean, what's wrong with the octopus thing? I mean, right, it's providing heat. It's, it's not, you know, they're cast iron. It hardly break. You know, it, it really just come. You know what it is, is people are afraid. So instead of being educated about something, mm-hmm. they it's easier to just be scared of it and say, I just want a new one. But all oh, these older systems are so much easier to work on if you can get parts for it, etc. Like yes, there are reasons. I don't want to say oh everything is fine. Sure. I mean, is it is it functioning? Is it good? I mean, why why are we going to get rid of this thing? Yep. Right. It's, it's a different story if you can't get parts for it and a part is breaking, etc. You want to update it? Yes, fine. But most things are functioning. Yeah. Some things just need a little help. But I'm talking defects that are that they're beyond repair. Yeah. You know, you're like, this house just needs to be gone. You know, find mold here. You don't know, need a new furnace. There's, you know, electrical panels, uh, you know, it's a recall issue. So, yeah, sure. And, you know, a lot of stuff is, is pretty easy to go by. But, I mean, as far as finding something you should be absolutely terrified of, mm-hmm. once a month. Once a month. So, oh, and before we go any further, I do want to say that we have Derek Foster's in the room, everybody. You can't see him on camera. I was trying to get him to sit over here, but... Uh, Next time. Next Everybody. time. We're, we're slowly creeping them in we're on, uh, you know, sooner or later we'll get them, we'll get them full-fledged in here on the podcast. But uh, welcome, Derek. Glad Thank you're you. here. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, uh, well, I, so I checked you out a little bit online, right, before the, before the show. And you have, it uh, looks like there's, there's five of you right now doing inspections or five people in your company. No, we have, 
eight now. Eight? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we hired. Well, we just hired a girl today. We got nine. Nine? We got nine people. Boom. Yeah. Uh, so tell us how it all got started. So, I mean, you didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to have a company with nine people in it. Here we go. No, I... Um, or maybe you did. <laughs> I, I mean, I started off by myself. You know, I had owned some rental properties and went through the process. Mm-hmm. I think this would be pretty cool to do. I like it. I got fired from the job, so I took the course. 2008, started the business, started the crash. Oh, nice. And just grew. You know, grew very, very quickly. Um, Even through the crash? Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't really have a baseline before that. So yeah. if I did, if I went from 30 to 80, you know, that was good. But I didn't have a baseline, you know, from 2004 up until, you know, where the market was hot. So... Uh, but nonetheless, it, it still was hard because a lot of people were getting out of the business. People were not buying homes. I mean, it's not like the market is now, man. It, right. It was very, very different. Homes sat on the market for one, two, three years. So, um, so I, I got in, got into it and did it. I had another job. I was working in the medical field and I was able to really use both. I was able to do both at the same time. The boss that I had, I was able to leverage that job and it benefited him and it benefited me and. And it just took advantage of what was there and it grew and it grew better than I ever thought it would. I never thought this would be, you know, a nine company thing. And I think a lot of people say that, um, but you know, fast forward, you know, he's working, I'm working by myself, I had this preconceived notion like, oh, you know, they never have employees, no one do it as good as me. And that was the energy from everybody, you know, in this area that I had been, you know, dealing with and talking to until I started getting outside of it and going to some conferences and mm-hmm. like, well, you guys have employees, you know, how do you do it? And it, it started, it was like a whole different business at that point. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm single, I live alone, and it, it, it's scary. If I fall off a ladder and get hurt, I don't own anything. So before, I, didn't, I never owned a business. People think they own a business. I didn't own a business. I owned a job. Sure. So if I got hurt, I can't work, there's no income. You know, what do you, what's your exit strategy, right? So now I can come do this. I'm getting paid mm-hmm. right now, right? Right. Do this, you know, got guys out there working and doing, and they're happy to do it, you know, provide them a good wage and, you know, they're very reliable and they rely on me, I rely on them. So it's nice. So you have your own, almost like family, you know, where you, you take care of one another and do yeah. it. You know, there are some bumps in the road, you know, going, getting here, but still working through stuff. But that's what really did it for me. I was like, you better do something because you can't just keep working all the time and then you go on a vacation you don't make any money and sure you're trying to keep all these things in your net and it's just it gets harder and harder and harder that was really stupid just thinking that you know i'd be able to sustain you know, that type of a lifestyle and a lot of people do it no oh, it's 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 funny that you say it too because we we talk about it all the time where a lot of people who are solo entrepreneurs working by themselves. They're really self-employed, right? They, they, they own their job, like you mm-hmm. said. Uh, they still say, I own a business, but a business from, from our definition is a collection of systems and processes that can be operated by other people. That constitutes a business. And so, like you said, if you are the business, it's not really a business, right? No, so it's not. I and mean, you go to sell the business, they extract what you are right? you out. Now, in a lot of ways, yes, I am the business. Just the nature of the business, you know. If I leave, it wouldn't be as successful as it is. I mean, it it would be successful, or maybe it could be, but um, you know, the reputation and everything is really is behind me. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I've thought about selling the business. It's very hard to sell. It's not really a saleable business. I've thought about buying other people's businesses, but what are you buying? You're buying anything because it's free will, you know. If the this person is no longer doing these inspections for these agents. They just move on to another to another guy. There's nothing to make them beholden right. to that inspector. There's no book of business. Yep. There's nothing there. So it's really But a lot of people don't get that. So when it comes to the, you know, when when buying and selling businesses, like you said it and so there's the goodwill of the business, the name, the website, the the brand, the logo, the you know, but if you don't have contracts you know, like if you don't have anything that goes like, what are you actually buying? And uh, it, well, it's it's you you would essentially have to buy me. But then why would I do that? Right. So as you're buying, I am the reputation. We get buying a reputation, so that's what you would be buying. But there's nothing tangible to that. Right. Like right. You know, I get the car crash. It's there goes everything. And somebody just spent a million dollars. <laughs> go, right. So it's 
it's interesting how it is. Right? You don't want a McDonald's like tangible asset. You you know you can just put anybody in there mm-hmm. and run them and do it. Uh, whereas this is this is a little tricky. It's very difficult business in my opinion. It's very hard. If I could go back and start doing a business again, I would not do this one. <laughs> it's, it's very hard. And that and I would never have a license to do it. Um, in that way there I don't have to work in the, in the business I have to mm-hmm. find ways for somebody to work for me in the business I think it's a big mistake a lot of guys make they start off as a single operating inspector and you know they grow and then they have to hire somebody else but they're always jumping back in it because they have a license and that's what you're going to do as a business owner Right. but if you remove that if you give yourself an excuse not to you're going to have to find a way to get those jobs done but at the same time you know you go through these schools and they they tell you how much money you can make by yourself. So you get almost almost like a fireman, you know, they're working three on, four off. They have a lot of days off where they can go out and do some inspections, maybe make a thousand bucks a week Mm -hmm. doing it or even a month. So it's really geared towards those types of people. It's not, hey, you can have a career doing this. So it's very hard to convince somebody who's not doing well to come work for me. But once they do, they're like, oh yeah, this is this is nice. This is good. So uh so backing up a little bit, you're you have a job, you're doing this mm-hmm. as a side hustle, we'll say. Oh yeah. What was the uh, what was the catalyst or what was the situation where you decided to go full time and leave the job behind and this is what I'm doing? Um, so I it was a mobile X ray job. It's a really cool job. You yeah. Know, we put a an X ray machine in the back of a car and I drove around a very large area. And I would tell my boss, I would say, Hey, I have an inspection in Schenectady at 2 o'clock, can I take my lunch and stay later? Uh, or, you know, however long it would take, I'll stay that long after work. Mm-hmm. And he loved it because they didn't have to pay overtime because you guys were on call. Sure. So they had to pay, you know, he had to pay when he was, he was saving money doing that. And he was very, worked with them. So I was like, yeah, I'll forego the money. And he's like, okay, as long as you have to work. And then I did. And I did him right, too. Um, it got to the point where I just stopped caring about that job and it wasn't fair to him. He was very good to me. Um, actually, it's funny, his son works for me now. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, it's just funny. Uh, but he, you know, very, very good to me. So I was able to do it. I was in a situation that I could leverage. If I worked in a hospital, there's no way. Right. So I was able to go out and stop in offices and really market myself in the downtime. So I took advantage of, of that. And, you know, I just knew every day, I was making like 20 bucks an hour. This is, I'm just making somebody else money. And yep. I was like, I don't, I don't really even want to do this. So I really started just getting into it and, and made it a point to do a certain amount of whatever office business, et cetera. Then, but then I just, it got too big. It got to be too much. Um, I ended up buying a house and I said, okay, you know, I don't need this W 2 anymore either. Right. I had gone from full time to part time. Um, and then I went from part time to not working there, and he, he really wanted me to stay. And I said, I, I said, man, I'm, I'm really not into this business that you. That'll stop anymore. ringing in a second. Sorry yeah, about that. Fine. <laughs> um, so he, he was like, oh, I totally understand. But it was, it was just time. I think I did like 380 inspections that year and worked that job. And I was just like, well, I don't need to be doing. Yeah. Anything. So it wasn't like you didn't have to like. Or you didn't set a goal of like, hey, when I start doing this number of inspections each month, I'm going to quit this job. It was just kind of, you just kind of played it by by feel, so to speak. Yeah, it's not like, I mean, I have kids with too many obligations. Like, I yeah. could work 24 hours a day if I wanted to. Um, pretty much what I felt like I was doing. But, you know, I was saving money to, mm-hmm. you know, be able to do other things. Do other it. things, being yeah. smart about it. What, yeah. um, so, so you, you leave... The job, the safety of the, the paycheck. You go out on your own, doing, obviously, plenty of work. Mm-hmm. At what point did you start to look at, I need to hire an employee or two or three? Um, well, the first person I hired, it wasn't even an inspector. Um, I had realized the amount of time I was wasting driving. And I said, man, I just, you know, I could really add another inspection into this day if I can have somebody drive for me and I'll just do the reports in the vehicle. So that's how it started. And then I said, why don't you have them help me on the inspection too? So they were assisting me and doing these. And then they kind of evolved into an inspector and did it. And that's really how it started. Hmm. Um, I needed more time in the day and I just found ways to create more time. Like where, where were the dead space? You know, what can I pay somebody to do? 
um, other than inspecting, you know, right now, and it was driving, I was driving three hours a day, I'm like, it's a no-brainer. Just get in the car, pay somebody, and that time I was paying them, you know, cash on the table because it was like here and there. So um, that's when I realized you know, I was working a lot, you know, 10, 11 at night. You know, it's just it's like this isn't a way of life. This isn't good. So I came home and I just came home. So it was very convenient for me to, to do that, just having a little bit of help. Yeah, that's smart. I, I know a lot of people start looking at scaling, and usually almost every time I talk to someone, their first hire is going to be a salesperson. I laugh every time I hear it because like, I think I need to hire somebody to do sales because they because everybody hates doing sales. Well, not everybody. Maybe you like it. Maybe I like it. Maybe yeah. Derek likes love it. it. Hey, right? <laughs> love it. Uh, but uh, most people that I run into just they freaking hate sales, right? So they're like, oh, I'm gonna hire a salesperson, you know. And it's just like, but I, I love the idea that no, no, I'm gonna hire someone that's gonna make me more billable, more efficient, getting the same amount of work done in a smaller amount of time. As smart as yeah, well, I mean, at the time, I, I, I never thought I would have another inspector anyways. You know, I still had that in my head. No one, you know, you, you just, you didn't do that. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that I didn't think I couldn't. You just didn't do that. They were, oh, no, you don't do that. It was taboo. And then I went to this conference, and I'm like, man, I've been lied to. I mean, there are people in this conference that are, you know, making $20 million, $25 million, $15 million a year going to home inspections. And I'm like, I mean, we can do this. This is right, not right. hard to do. It's already been figured out. Just be friends with them, ask them what they do. Yeah, and they're in a different market, right? Not competitors. And yeah, and so, hopefully. I mean, I even had competitors around here that helped me with my professionalism and, and do what I do, but there was a big, big gap between upstate New York and the rest of the world. What goes on. And there still is. I mean, I try to bring as much as I can here, mm-hmm. and I get all this information by going to these conferences and talking to people who are very, very progressive, you know, friends of like some of these guys, I got a friend down in Florida, he does like $15 million a year. And home inspections. Yeah. But he's in Miami. But... How much does a home inspection go for down there? I don't know, but the volume is there. The volume's there. So you're only going to have... That's what I'm wondering, I'm like, is it, you know... Yeah, you can only tap your market so much. So yeah. you start running your company by metrics, right? So everybody's sitting there beating their chest. For some reason in this industry, we seem to think like, oh, well, you know, I work 25 hours a day. I'm the man. I'm like, I don't really see it that way. Um, you know, I made this much money. I did this all on my own. I did all that on my own. I did. It's like, I don't, you know, I'd rather just be the guy. It's like, I did none of these things. I got people to do it. You know, for me, I have more free time to do what you're good at. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you're only good at inspecting a house, I don't, I don't, I don't make that much money. And, you know, you shouldn't. So... Um, it, it's more of a volume. So you, you run things by the metrics. It's typically between like 10 and 20 percent of, of your market, uh, you know, is what you can rely on. It's fair, that's very good. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a company in LA, I think they have like one percent of their market, but they do 30 million dollars a year. Oh my god, yeah, they're huge. They're they're probably the biggest. Uh, they're, they're a cool group of guys, too. Um, but it's all market dependent, you know, around here we had about 12, 14,000 home sales a year, roughly. I've mm-hmm. got it. I don't know. But we check them every month and we see are we in that 10 to 20% range or how are we doing? You know? Yes. Yeah. So that's how we run it. That's how we know we're doing good or bad. So I knew we were doing bad a couple months ago. <laughs> there are only 600 homes that we could have you know, inspected this month in the you know, greater, greater capital region. Um, so that really equivalents out to between 60 to 120 inspections. And now a lot of them, they're waiving the inspections to get to homes. It includes new construction, et cetera. So there is a margin of error, but that's what, that's what you can expect to, to have to, to really get out of that. And that's not a lot to run a business. I mean, overhead's a lot in this. In this. You, know, you need about 80 to 100 to really be comfortable be doing well. So if you only hit 60, you're in trouble. So, which means you need to get either need to get a bigger piece of the pie or create more home sales, which you can't do. So then you have to beef up your marketing. So sounds like you really know your numbers. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break. I want to come back and I want to talk to you about metrics and a few other things, of course. But, okay. All right. All right. This episode of Blue Collar Startup is brought to you by Daigle Cleaning Systems and DCS Franchising. Launch your blue collar startup with a proven system like Daigle Cleaning Systems. This episode is also brought to you by Spa City Digital. Take your blue-collar business to the next level with Spa City Digital, making marketing easier. 
Special thanks to our guest today, Matt Smith from Ace Home Inspection. And now, back to the interview. All right, so we're coming back uh, and still here with Matt Smith. Still here, I am. You know, uh, Matt Smith is my favorite doctor from Doctor Who. I don't know if you're familiar oh, with yeah. the Doctor Who, the newer Doctor Who episodes, but Matt Smith was the guy with the bow tie. Uh, so, just a little fun fact there for everybody, for the kids at home. So, right before the break, uh, you know, we started talking about marketing. We started talking about, um, you mentioned a lot about numbers. So, it sounded like I, you're throwing out percentages, you know, uh, market share, all these different things. So, uh, what can you tell us about the, the power of metrics or knowing your numbers? Well, it's like, it's like driving with your lights off if you don't know your numbers. You know, people think, I mean, the thing with numbers, you can make them look any way you want. Mm-hmm. But people think, I made 400 grand this year. Well, how much went out? How much is your client acquisition? How much are you getting per inspection? You know, so you need to know where you're actually wasting money or you're gaining money so you can really shift into those strengths. Uh, if you don't know your numbers, you have no idea what you're doing. And, and that, that was me at one point. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, you know, I got the money, it's there. People think just get your bank account. It's good. <laughs> right, I got cash in the account. Right, it's fine. And I mean, yeah, I guess so, but... If you really want to streamline this, if you really want to have some fun with a business, man, you can just make a couple tweaks and boom, those numbers, bang, they bang right up. You know, they do really good. So any, any uh, to anyone listening, any recommendations on what numbers you watch or what you think most businesses should watch? Oh, man, we have a bunch. We, Sarah, who is, as I say, she's my operations manager, but she's more of my general manager. She's... They, that woman saved my life. Um, she keeps track of everything. So anyone that I talk to throughout the day, I tell her we keep track of that person. Are we getting inspections? If I go to this office and then do meetings or, or do this or that, I you know we keep track of how many inspections are coming out of that office. If we get an office that's very good to us, we keep going to that office. You know we keep hitting it up. Uh, if something isn't working, we just, this isn't working. We're done with mm-hmm. it. Get it out of here. So we keep, that's a big one. Um, our kill ratio is huge. Right kill now. ratio? Yep, that's phone calls in to bookings. Okay. This month we are 100%. Everybody that called booked an inspection with us. So that, I mean, a lot of that is, you know, Sarah. You know, Sarah is very good on the phone with us. So, um, our average inspection price is, you know, it's nice to see that. In our coaching meetings, you know, people want to know what our average inspection price is. Um, our payroll numbers are a big deal. Your payroll should be between you know 42, 48 um, percent. That's a that's a big one. And most people, because yeah. if you're doing really well in certain months, you know the ratios change, the percentages change, and and then when the months are bad, they also change for the bad. So mm-hmm. you really need a good average. So a lot of people just peek at their numbers, you know, every month or every two months or sporadically. We check them all the time. We have a system that does it. You know, we just pull it off and shows it to us but is it a industry specific or yeah oh, okay yeah so finally we're getting some progression in this industry and there's some people who work really hard at making things better i mean it looks like a real business now you know when you, when you run it so it's easier now than it was even when i started with a multi-inspector firm mm-hmm. uh, but we compare last year's numbers to this year's numbers um, and i don't really love doing that because it's a new year new things are happening with the market yep um, but it's nice to just know Mm-hmm. You know if you're falling off really bad or you're, you're like, okay, this, you start seeing patterns and, and then you can play to the patterns or you can adjust certain things. But the kill ratio is a big one. If we don't have a good kill ratio. I love that you call it the yeah. kill ratio. I'm like, <laughs> what are we doing we don't have a kill ratio? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a big one. But I mean, you're, the tracking, man, that's, that's a big deal. You know? yeah. like I talk to a real estate agent, they go into a list and if we get a booking with them, if they get a tick next to their name and they do so. You know, if somebody wants sponsorship money for something here or there, and it's like, oh, you're not really getting many inspections from this person. Not. Right, easy to tell who, uh, yeah. Yep. You know, we'll take care of those who take care of us, and anybody out there who works knows that. But, but I'm being quite honest with you, man. Most people we talk to and, and we're around, they, they do. They use us. They're very happy with us. We didn't get nice. to where we're at by, you know, lying. So, right, having bad customer service. Yeah, we don't really, our retention is great too, and we keep track of that. Who haven't we seen in a little bit? Let's see what's going on with them. And now, how often are you looking at your numbers in general? Are you a weekly, a monthly? 
a couple times a week. A couple times a week. Just to see, you know, obviously a number of inspections in a month yep. is, is one thing. I like to look and keep track of, see what's going on, uh, keep track of who we've been in touch with and what we've done. But we scale it based off of monthly, mm -hmm. for the, you know, the majority of it. I mean, we can break it down to weekly or to daily, but I mean, to get a good average, you, you need some, some data in there. You can't do one day. Right. That's just stupid. Yeah, no, we, we have a scorecard that we look at. Every, I have my admin puts it together every week, sends it over to me. You know, it's like probably 15 numbers that I look at that yeah. tells me we're going in the right direction or right. there's an area, you know, from our different product services uh, that, um, you know, there's an area maybe we're faltering in. So we need to beef up, like you said, beef up sales and marketing or, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's tough. That's the only, I mean, metrics are good, you know, for money or you know, something that you can, you can count, but... What we can't count is you. There's no metric for service. Mm -hmm. There's no metrics for happy people. Other than maybe a Google review. Um, so it's usually the first thing that goes when people are trying to run a business is because there's nothing there that reminds you like your service sucks, unless you get a bad review. Right. So we always keep that in mind. And that's not a me There's no metric for that. Yeah. It, 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 so a lot of people will get away from that. They get so busy. But they get so busy chasing a bank account number, and you're, you do the elected. I did it. You know, oh, well, I'll get back to this person tomorrow. You know, they call me at nine in the morning. Yeah. Right. So, and that's what happens. So. Scalability, you know, man. It's, yeah. You have to invest in the service. You have to put people in place. That's always a, a good indicator. It's time to hire. <laughs> right. Because yeah, like work. I can't get back to people. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So let's jump to uh, the next part here. Uh, I don't want to call it rapid fire because another podcast person uses that. Oh, all right. But here's a bunch of questions. Oh, here we go. This is the here's a bunch of, bunch of questions segment of the show. So uh, first one, uh, thoughts on work ethic. <clears throat> well, <laughs> I mean, either you got it or you don't. I, I don't know. It's, I think everybody has motivation. To do something, mm -hmm. you know, is they just they're either motivated to do it or they're not. That's it. If you're not motivated, they just go find something you're motivated to do. Sure. Right. A person, you know, collecting change on the corner to buy drugs is probably you could say is more motivated, but they're more motivated to get what they want. You know, so if somebody really wants something, they'll find a way to do it. If they're not motivated to do it, this is not what they really want. They're not interested in it. Yeah. So I think it's in everybody. I mean, think about like when you first fall in love with somebody, man, you'll drive to. California to see, right? You'll do anything, right? You walk across glass. You'll you'll do things to get what you want. Okay. Everybody, everybody will. Uh, Fair. How about uh, college? You go to college? I did. Degree? I actually went to med school. Oh yeah. So clearly, uh, using your college education for what you do work now. Yeah, I. I, I will, <laughs> well, you know what? I worked in overnight as a, an X-ray tech, and this doctor he was in his seventies. I'm like, oh, he's still work on call he's like yeah and i'm like i don't know. this isn't the life i want to live man i want to do this my uncle's in the 70s he's a doctor still yeah, working man i would I, right now i'm 39 i mean i would just be a couple years into my career I'm like, yeah man, and in a ton of debt we're gonna you know we're gonna work like dogs I man there's a lot of just it's it's not a great environment it's not a good work environment and i was kind of seeing that looking at what they do yeah I'm just like man i don't know it's just like this is for me but yeah i went to college got a couple degrees and don't use them, but... Yeah. And well, you know, and it's it's an interesting thing, because out of the... This is our fifth episode, uh, and the only... There are only, only one person that actually went to college for what they are doing in their career uh, from a blue-collar standpoint. Everybody else, like, went to college, they got degrees, and then maybe they started doing something in that field and decided it wasn't for them, and then, you know, they're, like... Uh, you know, like I was a math science student. You know what I mean? Like Derek has a, a I think Derek actually has a business degree from RPI, um, but he's in a he's in a blue collar field. You know, so and and so just an interesting idea of talking to people about you know, hey, do you do you need? I, again, I'm not against college, but I'm also very pro trade school and very pro. Um, getting certified in what you're doing and and i i think training is important i think having some sort of you know we'll call it a certificate you don't want to just 
watch a couple of YouTube videos and then decide this is what you do for a living. But uh, just, you know, racking up all that student loan debt and then not using it kind of seems a little... Uh... Well, I mean, I think everybody, that's just what you do, mm -hmm. right? It's just like, well, I better have a kid and get married. You know, it's going through the progressions of life. I think it's actually going away. I think more people are starting to realize that. But that's what your parents told you to do because everybody was a plumber and electrician mm -hmm. and it's like, go get a job and you can pay somebody to do this. And I think millennials get a lot of, a lot of crap. But they were all told, go, go to college. Sure. Don't flip burgers. And now they don't want to flip burgers and everybody calls them lazy. Well, no, you told us <laughs> to go to college and we did. Right. Now we want our job. Yeah. Um, I think people believe that college is a guaranteed job when they get done and it's not the case either. Uh, it, I mean, the amount of debt people put themselves into, I think people are very aware. I mean, people are really, very irresponsible with debt. Mm -hmm. you know, know what you do. Have a purpose for it. I'm just going to go and see what happens. Well, you're kind of wasting your time. I mean, you'd be better off backpacking through Europe, or you'd be better off, you know, digging a ditch for a guy who, you know, does driveways or something. Yeah. You, know, you could learn a lot. You get some experiences until you want to figure that out. You know, go see some things first. You know, who the, how the hell do you know? You were in high school. What do you even know? You know. Nothing, I know. Right, and uh, it's like he, the whole world becomes open to you. And then it's like, here, do this thing. And you're like, I don't really know if this is going to work out. And most of the time it doesn't. But it's kind of what we're told to do. And most people are just afraid, I think, to take a chance. It, it, it seems like a safe bet. Go to college, get this degree, I go get a job, and then you just fall into the It at least line. delays the real world for a little while, for four more years. Yeah, I mean, if you want to go have fun and party, <laughs> you, know, you can definitely do that. But it's I don't think it's a waste. It, it's, I, I think people are just not utilizing it properly. You know, some things you could do. There's some college courses I took that were awesome that I, yeah. if, I kind of would like to take them again. You know, they're interesting, they were cool, but I think college is a misused tool. Yeah. You know? I, honestly, I think if I did it all over again, I would uh, skip college, at least for a couple of years, travel, maybe learn a trade, and then start working, making some money. And then if, I, if it came to a point in time where I wanted to do something that required college, then I might do that. Like if, hey, I decide one day I want to go to med school to become a doctor, that makes sense. Or, hey, I want to go to law school to be a lawyer, that makes sense. But uh, I don't know, I just I see all these kids spending all this money on liberal arts degrees, man. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I also, I mean, I was in Hudson Valley for two years, yeah. got an extra degree. I don't regret it at all. I made a lot of money. I made a lot of friends. I had a lot of great experience. I worked at Albany Medical Center. I mean, sure. the experiences there, they, they were tremendous. And uh, I wouldn't regret it for a second. You know, I thought it was a very good idea at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't serve me anymore. But 20 years ago, it certainly did. And I was okay. able to live a, a good life because of it. A very stable job. I met some great people. Um, but it was very specialized. There was a high demand for it at the time, too. So if somebody goes for nursing, and say, yeah, yeah you, you, you'll do very no, well. No, and I 100% yeah. I think that people should. Well, I, yes. I think my, you know, my overall idea on it is just that we're... We're shoving all these kids into college with no yeah. design. Yes. And for no other reason than it's what you're supposed to do, quote unquote. And I just really think that we'd be better off uh, if you if you want to go to nursing school, go to nursing school. Right. Right. Become a nurse. Then you have a job. Like then we know you're gonna have a job. But just going to school for the sake of going to school just seems like such a waste. Well, you know it's also I this I'm gonna sorry yeah I don't know if I talk too much about it but <laughs> the BOCES program in high school is like. I, you don't even have to go to college. You can do this. BOCES program, you do very minimal training when you get down to high school, and you're good to go. And, and it doesn't have to be a trade, like an electrician or my nephew's going for uh, video game design. My daughter goes for graphic design. I, and there's Absolutely. this stigma that like dumb people go there, and I'm like, eh. I, I know that when we grew up, when we were kids, right? So I'm 45, I'm a, little, a few older, years older than you are, but I know that when I was growing up, like that's the way the kids that were going to BOCES were... Um, were picked on for going to BOCES. They were, you know, almost a like, they were they were a lower class than everybody else because they're going to BOCES. But it's just not the case, right? But again, that comes back to the whole stigma around blue collar and go to college so you get a good job because being a plumber or electrician or any of those things isn't a good job, which we all know is not the truth, right? Well, it's even superficial that my kid got into this college. Absolutely. Who gives his cares man yeah who cares you know i'd rather my not kid, our listeners yeah <laughs> i'd just rather somebody you know my kid or somebody be happy and, and do something you know when you do something hands-on anything hands-on is art right yeah. interior design is art you know if you're a carpenter it's art it's so you get to really express yourself through 
this trade or this thing that, that you're doing. If you cut hair, there's a lot of money in a lot of these things too. But everybody, you know, especially adults, they want to attach their child's success to them. Mm -hmm. And I think what they don't do is they're not worried about how happy their kid is. It's just, no, you need, you need to go to Harvard or make right. his family look good. Pressure, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, just, I mean, we can go down that rabbit hole most Oh my God, <laughs> no, listen, that, that's a big tangent for me too. Um, all right, how about uh, day-to-day routines? You got any uh, crazy weird stuff you do in the morning to get yourself going? You doing any? No, I and I should. I'm trying to be better with stuff. I mean, I go to the gym. Mm -hmm. um, consistency and regimen is, is important. You know, go to the gym, eat well. You know, I want to do things daily, you know, for self-care, et cetera. I mean, we always make excuses to do things that aren't good for us, but we rarely make excuses to do things that are good for us. Mm -hmm. so, once so in a while, I have to remind myself, like, hey, you don't have to keep punishing yourself. You know, you're, you're, this isn't good. Yeah. This, you know how this is going to end, and it's not going to be well. So take care of yourself and do these things. Uh, you know, I want to be productive, uh, but I, I mean, things get thrown at me all different throughout the day. I try not to have this plan because so I feel like if I have a plan and it goes sideways, then you get all frazzled. Nothing went according to plan. So, uh, but what I do is I do set a boundary for myself. Like if I'm on vacation. Or if I'm spending time with my girlfriend, it, nothing else. It doesn't matter. I don't. I don't care. It can wait. Yep. If I'm out to dinner, I'm not on my phone. That type of stuff. So the quality time with people is, you know, those are the boundaries that I set. Or I'll say, you know, nine o'clock or eight o'clock or seven o'clock. It's it. I'm done. You know, I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna chill. I'm gonna read a book. or watch a movie or do something. It's those types of things. But within those other hours, yeah, you run around. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's chaos. But it's hard. It's really hard for me to hold the regimen. I mean, my schedule changes every day. Yeah. You know, first appointment could be at 10, it could be at 1, it could be at 7 in the morning. I mean, you never know. So it's kind of tough for me to do it. But I like to get up early because not everybody else is up. Then you like have time to think about what you're going to do. You know, get I just I just switched my morning routine so I get up at 4.30 now. And because uh, I've got, I got four kids. <laughs> yeah. And and pigs and chickens and all the other stuff we got going on, the front, dogs and cats. Uh so yeah, I had to start now. I'd get up at four thirty so I can get like I get a workout in, eat breakfast, have like twenty minutes of you know whatever. Yeah, you know I just need that a few times throughout the day. Like I just need my half hour of like just leave me the hell alone. Yeah. <laughs> so I can figure out what happened, catch up with stuff, and then I'm good again. Yeah. And you can just keep dumping more on my plate, and we're good. But when it just be, starts piling up and I can't remove things, I get really frustrated. You know, I get pissy and I'm like, it's so. I, and that's one thing when I hired the driver that I lost and I didn't realize at the time to so drive from inspection to inspection. And that was my time. The radio was on, you know, somebody's out a half an hour drive and you, you just decompress. Yeah. You're good. You, you know, you're fresh for the next one. That never happened. It was just go, 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 go. So, you know, as far as a routine, no, but knowing when I need a break, I just need a minute, mm -hmm. you know, I'll do that. I'll, I'll run into, you know, create an appointment and go do something for 20 minutes. Put yourself in time out. Exactly. All right, last question. If you were going to give listeners one piece of advice on being successful in a blue-collar business, blue-collar field, what would it be? Uh, just go for it. You, know, you have to do it. Stop thinking that you know, it can't be done. or it, you, you can do anything. Man. We have more resources in this world than ever. It's the greatest time to be alive, and then tomorrow it'll be an even greater time to be alive. It's, it's, it's very simple to be successful. You just have to have consistency and do it. But you have to commit. You can't diversify yourself and expect something to proliferate. It will never happen like that. Um, it's not a garden, right? We just plant a bunch of seeds and you know, we'll see what happens. You, you have to go all in on things. I mean, if you look at people who have been very successful, they didn't have 30 businesses and then one of them was good. And I know this is, sounds silly coming from me because I started this as a, as a side job, but who knows where I would be if I had those resources at that time and had fully committed earlier. So I think commitment is, is very, very important with anything in life. You know, the more you commit into something, then the better it's gonna be. I mean, you can imagine how much you're, you know, a Mormon's seven wives love, you know, their husband, right? I mean, you, there's only so much to go around. So it's very important with anything. You got you gotta make sure you go all in on it. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah. You hear that, Nike? Just do it. 
Uh, so if someone wants to find you, has a question for you, they've heard this, they're like, I got to talk to this guy, uh, where can they find you? Well, they can find me on the internet, um, acehomeandline.com. You can get a hold of us through there. Um, you know, we have our email set up through there, phone number, you, you'll get Sarah, but Sarah can direct it. But yeah, you can shoot over an email through the website. Okay. Uh, social media outlets at all? Yeah, not too, too, too crazy into that, but it's a lot to manage. It's tough man um but yes i am on facebook matt okay. smith good luck finding me all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> businesses on facebook too they can yeah, find yeah, you there yeah. ace right. home inspections yeah. ace home inspections all right all right well thank you very much for joining us uh and thanks for listening us here at blue collar startup where each episode we are interviewing real blue collar entrepreneurs business owners and managers to help educate and empower our listeners to become the next generation of blue collar businesses. If you're looking for more information about what we're doing or how to get involved, you can find us at bluecollarstartup.io. We're on Instagram at the blue collar startup, and we're about to be on some other social media channels and Rumble. Check out rumble.com. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.